Hi, everybody. Andrew Gill here, Minister of St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Black Rock, Gill and Bray. And welcome to our weekly Church at Home video sermon. On our website, we have other resources to go along with this message. There's some songs, uh, prayers, readings. Um, so if you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube, please do click on that link um, so you can have a service wherever you're watching this today at home. One of my favorite things about Jesus was the way he told stories. He was a great storyteller. One of the things that made him such a great teacher and a great communicator is the way he used a type of story called parable. These parables are enjoyable to listen to, they are memorable, yet they contain just deep spiritual truths about what the kingdom of God is like, about who Jesus is and what it is to follow him. And one of the things that makes Jesus such an amazing storyteller is that in just a couple of sentences, in a 60 second story, he can give you almost a lifetime of material to think and to dwell about and to bring change into your life. This is part two of a series looking at some parables that Jesus told. And today we're looking at the parable of the Good Samaritan. This is probably a story that's familiar to a lot of us. Even if you've never been to church or never read the Bible, you've probably heard about a good Samaritan before and maybe have some idea about what that means. But I think to properly understand the meaning of this story that Jesus told, we need to understand why he told it and who he told it to. Because he gives this story in answer to a question that he was asked. We find the story in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. And it begins with a lawyer, uh, an expert in the religious law, coming to Jesus with a question. And it says that he was trying to test him, maybe even trap him, hoping that Jesus would say something wrong and he could kind of catch him out. But he says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answers his question with another question. He says, well, you know the law. How do you understand it? And he summarizes all the commands by saying that we must love God with all our heart, mind, soul and strength and love our neighbor as ourself. Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But then we read that the man wanting to justify himself asks, and who is my neighbor? He wanted to know who do I need to love and who do I not need to love? He wanted to know the borders of his love. Is my neighbor just the people who live directly beside me or do I need to care about the person who lives at the other end of the street? Is it just my neighborhood that I need to care about? And I don't need to concern myself about the poor people who live in the next village. You know, when it says that I have to love my neighbor, what does that exactly mean? He's a lawyer. He wanted to know what the small print was because he was trying to earn his way to God by following the law rather than receiving the free gift that Jesus would give him of that relationship with God by grace. And so he asks, who exactly is my neighbor? What are the borders of my love? And Jesus responds with this story. Let me read it to you uh, as it comes up from uh, verse 30. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho would have been a dangerous road. There was lots of caves, places where robbers and thieves could hide and attack people as they walked down. And this man was a victim of such an attack. They took all his money, all his possessions, all his clothes. They gave him such a beating that he was unable to move. He was left there to die. When all of a sudden, a priest walks by. 
The priests were the religious elite. They knew all about God. Their life was dedicated to leading others in worshipping God. For the lawyer that was asking the question about his neighbour, the priest would have been somebody that he looked up to, respected. And so probably in many ways, as that man was listening to this story, he would expect the priest to be the hero, to be the rescuer of this man, and probably put himself in that role in the story. He saw himself as the priest. So imagine the twist of this story. Imagine the shock to the listeners to find that when the priest saw this man, he didn't help him. In fact, he walked as far away from him as possible. And then a Levite who would have helped the priest in the temple also comes by, also sees the man and also passes by on the other side. These people that you would expect to be the hero of the story are actually a negative example. They tell us what we shouldn't do. And for the man listening to this, his place in the story now becomes uncertain. And he's asking himself, well, what would I do if that was me? If I was walking down that road and I saw that man, what would I do? Would I stop to help or would I keep on going? Maybe we need to ask that same question as well. What would we have done? What do we do? If we see somebody begging on the street, do we go over to them? Or do we cross over and try to avoid them? If we're at work or in school and you see somebody that's obviously upset, do we just try and avoid them and not engage with what they might be dealing with? When we see people that need our help, what is our initial response? To show compassion or to try and pass by? But the story with Jesus goes on. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. For us, we tend to use the name Samaritan to describe somebody that does a good deed for a stranger. So when we read this story, we expect that this Samaritan will be good and to help out the person. But for the first listeners to this story, they would have been shocked and surprised that a Samaritan helped this man. And it was a real twist in the story. The Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along. They would have had a shared history, but now they've got different religions, different cultures, different practices, and the Jews really looked down on the Samaritans and didn't like them at all. Even though Samaria was a neighboring nation to Judea, there was no love between these two places. And so it is a surprise that the Samaritan is so kind and that he is the hero of this story. And he is the positive example of how we should love others. And look just at how well he loved that man. When he saw him, he had pity on him. He had compassion and he did something about it. He took care of his wounds. He put him on his own donkey and he brought him in to an end to make sure he could heal properly. It was a risky move. It was sacrificial. It cost him a lot. It cost his, his money, his possessions and his time. He was committed to helping this person until they fully recovered. This is a picture of the type of love that we should have for others. When we see people in need, we shouldn't cross to the other side away from them, but we should show them real love and help them in real, practical, physical ways, no matter what it might cost us. But that is not 
the end of this story. And we haven't fully got to the full meaning of this story quite yet either. Because Jesus finishes this story with a question. And he says to the man, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And by finishing this story, by putting the focus on the victim of the attack, we get to the heart of what this story is all about. You see, by putting ourselves in the place of the priest or the Levite, we're shown how not to love other people. By putting ourselves in the shoes of the Samaritan, we're shown an example of how we should love others. But when we put ourselves in the place of the person lying there half dead on the side of the road, it shows us who our neighbor is. See, the man who asked the question about his neighbor wanted to live in a world of us and them. There's the people that are like me, there's the people that I like, there's the people that agree with me, and those are the people that I am gonna care about. But I don't wanna care about the people that are different to me, that disagree with me. I don't want to love or to care for them. The lawyer wouldn't have wanted a Samaritan family moving in next door to him. He wouldn't have welcomed him into his home. He wouldn't have shared a meal with him. He probably wouldn't have shown him any kindness. Yet, when Jesus asks him that question, it forces him to think if he was in a place of need, how would he want to be treated by others? And of course, in that situation, he would welcome help wherever it would come for. Because it doesn't matter when you need mercy, doesn't matter where that mercy comes from because you are in need of help. And we need to realize that our neighbor is anyone that is in need. Anyone that we can show compassion or mercy to, those are the people that we should live. Our world is so divided at the moment. It's divided by race, divided by politics, divided by wealth divided by opinions and attitudes. Even in the church, we're divided by theology and styles of worship. We want to live in a world where we say, you're my neighbor, but you're not. But Jesus paints such a different picture of what the kingdom of God is like. It is not a place of division, but a place of love. Not a place of prejudice, but a place of compassion. Not a place of selfishness, but of mercy. And of course, what makes this story so powerful and what gives Jesus such authority as he speaks is that we know for Jesus, this was not just a story. This was how he lived. Jesus, when he saw people, he had compassion on them. He never walked to the other side, but walked closely to those that were in need. He reached out to the outsider. He helped the poor. He healed the sick. He had compassion on everyone that he met. When we were dead in our sins, he saw us and he came from heaven to earth to save us, sacrificing his life to give us forgiveness and to give us life and to save us. He has shown us what it is to receive compassion. At the end of the story, the man listening to it responds to Jesus's question and says that the neighbor was the one who showed mercy. And Jesus says to him and to all of us, go and do likewise. Father God, I thank you that after I had fallen into the hands of sin, you showed me your great compassion by sending Jesus to die from my sins. Lord, I am sorry for all the times that I have failed to love my neighbor as myself. Holy Spirit, open my eyes to see those who are hurting and open my heart to act with mercy. Lord Jesus, I have heard your parable of the Good Samaritan, 
help me to go and do likewise. Amen.